welcome to everyone um, to our 10th of the Create HDR series. Um, welcome back to, to those of you who joined us last time. Um, my name's Sue Olovich and it's um, a pleasure to be introducing the session today. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I work and learn today. I'm on the land of the Darawal people and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Olivia Cariolis. Um, Olivia, I did a little bit of searching for your bio and I found some <laughs> wonderful things about you, which I'd love to share with the group. And so Olivia completed her PhD research at the University of Sydney after working in the US in the fields of early childhood education and special education. And much of her focus has been on creating inclusive communities through the framework of the creative arts. And while she was living in Los Angeles, her work was recognized by the Kennedy Center and she was awarded a contract to implement programming with the Los Angeles Unified School District. And she's also prepared teachers at Santa Monica College and provided professional development for them. And she now teaches across the School of Education and Social Work at Sydney University. And I'm so excited about today's presentation, which she's titled, You Can't Say No to Play puppetry as a tool for participatory research. And in Olivia's presentation today, she asks, how do we ensure that all children and young people can participate in research? And she's going to share her research story that examined the object of a puppet as a tool to facilitate connection, play, communication, and engagement with children who experience disability. Um, Really warm welcome to you, Olivia. Thank you Thank so you. much for taking the time to, to share with us today and uh, really look forward to, to your presentation. And I've brought along uh, my puppet, Tommy, who uh, just didn't want to miss an opportunity to engage with other puppets. <laughs> no, and I love the way you place him, Susan. He's just gorgeous. So as you see on my slide here, I have Mabel and Mabel is with me today as well. And I really never leave home without her. And in many of the, the schools that I went to in the United States, Mabel came with me. And she's come with me on in my research in Australia as well. How I use a puppet is very important. And the placement, what attracted me about Susan's background is that Tommy is seated. And I think what's very important when we're thinking about a puppet is I'm just going to change my slide, is what exactly is it? I'm speaking about her now. Um, puppets originate from the word pupa, which means doll. Um, it, puppet can be anything. We can have marionettes. We can have hand puppets. We can have finger puppets. I can put two eyes on my finger and do that, and that can become a puppet. Any meaning can be made through visual, language, oral, gestures, puppets can wave. The magic with the puppet is that the puppet doesn't really exist without the puppeteer. But what the puppeteer is doing doesn't really exist without the puppet. So there is this magic made through the connection. My interest in puppetry began when I first started teaching and I was teaching uh, primary school children who were I had 14 children in my class who, who in those days were described, and this is going back about 20 years, as profoundly having profound disabilities. So that's a fabulous label to walk around with. Um, I just saw beautiful children who communicated and expressed their, eyes very, their ideas very differently, mostly without words. And I'd come from a drama background. So I was always talking, always using body language, blah, blah, blah. It didn't land anywhere. And I was really struggling with one particular student who spent the majority of the day destroying the classroom, just tearing around, pulling things off the classroom. And I was following him. It was, it was fabulous. And he would not speak in class, not one word, but all his reports and his mother had said that he had quite a significant vocabulary, um, none of which he was willing to, to use in the classroom environment. It became clear 
that in transitioning from home to school, he hadn't made the connection yet to use words, which is often what might happen with children who experience autism. They may associate language in one setting only, but not transfer that to a different setting. So school was just too confusing, too much new things, too unfamiliar. And so he wasn't using any language to express his ideas at all. I was at a loss and went home on a Friday afternoon, just feeling as though I was unable to make any connection with this little boy and failing him terribly. I had spoken to his mum and she told me how much she loved animals. So I went back to my drama. And the next Monday morning, I fronted up at school with, a, with not with, with Mabel, but with a different puppet, a horse puppet. And we sat down for news. And I had the puppet sitting on my lap. Um, his name was Biscuit, short for Sea Biscuit, the famous horse. And I was sit and so I looked down at me, and suddenly this little person who I will call Joel um, was charged, he was usually charging around the room by the stage, he was right next to me, looking up. And I took a punt and I turned the puppet towards him and said, Hello, Joel. And this Look, boy, bless his cotton socks, turned around and said, hello, puppet. <laughs> and all of, and I just, in shock, turned around and then said, what, tell us, tell everyone about your weekend. On the weekend, I went to the Manly Sea Aquarium and I saw this, he listed all the sea creatures. It was incredible, the language that this little boy had inside of him that was released by the puppet. So my curiosity then was piqued about how puppets could actually give children another language. We talk a lot about the hundred languages of children. Puppets are definitely one of them. My understanding about this after 20 years of working with puppets with children from diverse backgrounds, children without any spoken language, children with some language, children who speak a language other than English, um, children with autism, is that the puppet is much easier to read. Grown-ups, other people, other children are very unpredict unpredictable. Children with autism in particular like the familiar. When you look, if you can see Mabel now, what do you see about her? Terry, I'll ask you, how many colours do you see? Um, just two colours and then obviously the black of her eyes. So for a child with sensory processing, there's not too much to take in. She's very clearly a duck. I will, you know, but what I will do is ask children to tell me, or Mabel may not know what animal she is. She may be feeling, as you can see, she can communicate feelings. And I might say to the children, do you know, tell me how, how do you think she feels right now? And they might say, Oh, sad. sad. Oh, and I'll ask her, so Mabel, do, do you feel sad? Oh, would you like to tell me why? Oh, can I ask the children why you feel sad? Everybody, Mabel doesn't know what, what creature or animal she is. And we're wondering if you could tell her. And then the children are then in part. So then I know, oh, they know she's a duck. Or, oh, they think she's an elephant, if there's any confusion generally that so then it we're clear so that shared meaning that co-construction co of this puppet's identity begins there they may name her they may or him they may talk about what her likes dislikes are but it's so much easier when you have given puppet the voice that then she's able to open up the voices of others and any puppet can do that so in research, this is very handy for many reasons. I'm just going to put you down it. Um, when working with children, one of the, the biggest dilemmas in my research was wanting to represent their thoughts and feelings about things. I didn't want to do the research about them or on them. I wanted to do the research with them. And I wanted to... <laughs> My research was about inclusive pedagogy, so I wanted to include everybody. And that was why I, and I see you've put a heart there, Terry, so I think we're singing the same song here. How did I 
when most research happens with people asking people questions in focus groups or in interviews, access children who that was not their primary language. Suddenly the puppet opened possibilities for me. I was able to use the puppet to one of my research questions was, you know, was about engagement and how in the early childhood settings, many children, particularly children who have autism, are not my dog is now just loving me. I think he's giving me a heart too, Terry. Um <laughs> was you would see children sitting on the sideline. You'd see them on the buddy, no, you, this is going to be recorded beautifully, Susan. <laughs> you would have all the children seated in front of you of the, or you or the teacher and then three children who have a disability seated on seats up the back next to their their one-on-one -on -one support well that's not inclusion for me and so my first thing was how did I engage these children how did I would they want to participate how did I get consent they can't necessarily say yes or no some might be signing but some won't be so consent in my mind was if they agree to join and there would be no teacher dragging them over by their hand, no one enticing them to come. They came voluntarily. The puppet brought about their was my method of consent. They, they, if they saw the puppet in our learning experiences, in our drama activities, and they came and joined us, that was their consent. Um, and then I used the puppet to, to explain to the children and say, we're doing some drama for Olivia to learn some things about what you like to do at school and how we can all play together. If you don't want to stay and do that, you can shake your head, your hand. The puppet would then model the consent process. What was really nice was that in one moment, we were in outside doing a puppetry session outdoors because the educators were interested in how they could include more of the children in outside play activities. One little boy who had no language, he used to run off. And then that was his way of saying no to any classroom experience or any nap time, lunch time, table like top activities. He would just bolt. That was his way of saying no. With puppetry and circle time with me, he always stayed. He always sat next to me. He looked at the puppet. He followed what the puppet was doing. Um, sometimes he did approximations of the actions, which is an almost um, representation for those who don't know what an approximation is. It might be a, that might be a wave. So it's sort of, it, but it's similar. Um, outside when we were there, there was a lot of noise. There was a lot of distraction. I was curious to see if he would stay. What he did was he would be part of the group time in the outdoor area, then he'd run off, run up three steps, run back and come back to the group. So he was starting to manage himself, his feelings of being overwhelmed, telling us when he needed to go away, but then return. So he understood that he had permission to leave if he needed to. Um, well, that's what I inferred from that action. He kept coming back, but he also went away and then he came back when he could and continued. And he only went away for a few seconds. And I think it was just to calm all the sensory information of being outside and doing puppets and drama. So puppets gave me a way to gain data collection, to engage with all children in a way that was nonverbal, to gain their assent, to use gestures, model gestures for things. It also gave me a way to engage some of the children in data analysis because I had images of and video of the drama experiences or the puppet experiences. And then I could go back to the children and say, you know, tell me where you see the puppet here, which point to a part of the picture that you liked. If you didn't like it, don't point. So I was able to start seeing what parts of the day, what parts of the drama they were enjoying, where they were included to give them some, some voice in this process. Um, and so here you have me working with children here about engagement, about joint. One of the things we were looking at was joint attention, where all children come together and share meaning. I can see by the eye contact here that all three of those children, and you can't see the rest of them because they were in a circle going around me, 
um, were also engaged in that. So it's that seating formation that's really, really important, that circle time. Um, also, what was very interesting with puppetry as research is that it shifts the power dynamic. I, if I have an interview and perhaps, you know, I ask you, Susan, tell me about your favourite drama strategy. It's very different to if I say, Susan, would you like to tell Eloise about your favourite drama strategy? There's no, the power's different. I'm this lady who gets to hang out with them. I hang out with Eloise or, you know, all the puppets and the creatures. Suddenly the position of the adult being the one in power, being the one to give the right answer to, being the one to please is shifted and taken away because I'm playful and I'm fun and I'm connected to the puppet. So a different environment is set up immediately, a much more low stakes environment that I think contributes so much to the research process, particularly when we know from other research how much young children are very aware of saying the right thing, are very aware of what not to say or share and or can be. And so the puppet then gives more permission for everybody to feel comfortable sharing their ideas. In part of my research that I found was, I definitely have experience in drama. I'm like you, Terry. I've been in drama and loved it for a long time. But I'm not a professional puppeteer. And you don't need to be to use puppets in research. You just have to be authentic with them and you have to be respectful of them in your handling with them, in the time that you take to introduce the puppet to a child. That you don't, for example, if I had, I wait for the children to come to the puppet the first time. I never take a puppet up to a child's face and I wait for them. Would you like to come and meet Eloise? You know, oh, let's sort of, and we go around the circle and come up. Many children will want to, especially if they hear her voice, figure out where the voice is coming from. That's why children will put their hand. So before that, I will, I, I really think it's part of them figuring out what's happening with puppets. I explain to the children, you know, that if they would like to touch the puppet, they have to ask her first. And she would like to be patted with two fingers on the head. I borrowed that from the LA Zoo when they touch animals. It then reminds them or shows them how to interact with the puppet. So that's a very important, I think, boundary to put in place. It's once you've created that respect for the object, the children do perceive the puppet as being real. I often get asked, what do you say when children say, oh, that's not real? I've never had that experience. I have never had a child ask me that. And I don't know really how to answer. I, I will say that the puppet, yes, the puppet is, is working with me. We are together as one. So it's, it is an object. It's a creative object, but it's slightly magical. So those kinds of things come together. Um, in doing some research, on puppets, I've come across this fabulous um, project that people can use puppets to kind of tease out or nut out an aspect of their research story. It might be part of their data analysis. I remember sitting with a sea of research all around me on the floor, bits of paper, photos, images, videos, drawings I didn't know where to start and I wish I'd seen this because I think it's a really handy way to perhaps start to find your research story and I wondered Susan if there was time to share it um then I'll press play but That's gosh it would be fun to have some kind of puppet tinker lab like this I say, Reginald, this Earl Grey is magnificent. Indubitably, Gertie, my dear. I'm so sorry I'm late. I had to drop my kids off at daycare today. That is unacceptable. 
Okay, you can have some free time to play since you're all done with your chores. This class is called Thinking Through Puppets. It's a cross college challenge class, which means that students come from all over the university to develop skills in teamwork, oral and signed communication, creativity and innovation, and research. I co teach with Jessica Bozik, who teaches in the writing program. We talk about puppetry history, we look at global puppetry, contemporary puppetry, but really, most of the time is spent making things. <laughs> I think my favorite part has been just having the space to create. Obviously, none of us come from a background of puppetry or have had experience doing this in the past. And nobody here, I think, is even from the College of Fine Arts. At first, I had assumed that, you know, puppetry is sort of a childish thing, but I was pleasantly surprised to see how you have to plan out things and how you have to breathe life into these puppets. It is so thought provoking. So I guess we should just kind of go over the plan for today. We have five grad students who are going to be talking to us a little bit about their research. So another way in which the Cross College Challenge is unique is that we have clients. Students partner with masters or doctorate students to create a piece in collaboration with them about their research, about their dissertation. It's such an unusual combination Students have tackled things that are very abstract or conceptual. For example, the way that humans relate to animals in 20th century literature, the process of civil forfeiture, protein folding, and how that can be related to disease. We have to really think about, well, what kind of puppetry tells this story best? How do we treat this topic with the respect that it deserves while conveying it in a way to almost any audience? Never fear proteins. We'll get to the bottom of this situation and get you back to carrying out your function. One of the things that's pretty unique to puppetry is that it really is a language of metaphors, like a visual language of metaphors. And so it makes students very aware of how much of our lives, the way we make meaning, our interactions with each other are saturated with metaphor and negotiated by metaphor. And they actually are crafting metaphor. I've explored like a creative side I didn't know I had. For all of us, I think it's just so interesting to see like the different artistic styles. You know, you can have hand puppets, there's shadow puppetry, there's the classic Muppet form, there's crankies where you scroll and you kind of go through. When someone takes the time to craft a story, craft little figures, it's like there's this whole other layer of care and a focus that's brought to that. And that gives people a little bit more of an investment in the story. So you infuse it with your own imagination, with your own emotion. And I don't know, somehow those stories really become ours as much as they are the puppeteers. <laughs> what a fantastic... Uh illustration isn't it mm. and I just think a place just to you know I keep thinking about speaking through puppets and connection through puppets and reaching others through puppets and I've been in the presence of children who have never said a word to another person and say their first word to a puppet that is the privilege of my work um, and it is such a joy to be there um, when that can happen and be there with their teachers or their parents. It, but beyond that, to really extend a child's communicative repertoire through puppetry and particularly in research, but also to start using some puppet thinking through puppets. You know, I really hoped that today would get people thinking about, well, how could I perhaps communicate ideas in my research through puppetry? How can I get a clearer picture of this research story through perhaps creating an artifact through puppets? Or, And I don't know, you know, Terry, if you can think about what is something that an aspect of your study that you might be able to tell through a puppet or get a greater sense of through puppet play. 
Sure. Um, it's such a great question. I've, I've got something to respond to the video. I'll, I'll give that question some thought in the, in the background and then I'll yeah. come back to it. Um, I feel like I first have to be 100% clear what my research is actually about at the moment. Yes. I'm in the, yes. the swampy quagmire. Um, That's but fun. we actually did, we did a very um, similar project to what was in the, the video, just not with pairing up sort of more senior students with um, earlier, earlier students. Um, I work on a theater and education course. And during COVID, we had to, oh, have I lost everyone? Mm -mm. No, we're still here. Oh, there, am I still there? Sorry, my, my screen suddenly froze. I thought I'd lost everyone. And during COVID, we weren't allowed to go into schools. So we normally work in schools. Mm -hmm. And we shifted the whole program to um, digital puppetry. So we did a very similar thing where we, um, the students who had no, necessarily didn't have arts training or anything, they did a series of workshops on creating puppets and they weren't, we were still in a very hard lockdown. So they weren't mm. even allowed to work in the same space. So they had to all create like the same backgrounds that when they filmed, there was continuity. Um, and it was also the most wonderful, like, phenomenal um, experience. I had a piece about body consent that will stay with me forever. Thank you. And so that's sort of what I wanted to think and share with people today is when you do your research, think about, yes, puppets can be used to gather evidence. They can be used to analyze evidence as part of your analysis, particularly with children. Um, children can talk about what they did with the puppet so you get a sense of whether they're seeing those experiences. You can revisit them through images. I did it mainly pictures where the children would revisit and look at pictures of themselves in, in puppet experiences and they could talk about what they learned there. Or just, I just listened. The, the images in the puppet often bring the language. And it takes, there's that object that then is particularly, we know that for children with autism, that their play is usually object driven, but a puppet's an object. So you can use the puppet as a wonderful way for connection. Um, and so to have people start thinking about where they might be able to weave some, and there's so many different types of puppets. They don't have to be, my favorite ones are those two two colored animals. I generally don't have people. That's why I was so interested in Tommy um, because I think that's the next stage often for children with autism to go to a person, a people like puppet is harder. Um, but the animals are, are generally very appealing to children, all children. Um, and then to start thinking about, well, could you tinker around with puppet play? Could that help you? If you were going to put your research question into a short puppet play or create a puppet, where would what would that help you find? What would you see differently to play around creatively with different aspects of puppetry as you discover your research story? Well, Olivia, that's just just fascinating. There are so many elements of what you talked about today that I found so so interesting. One one thing that really stood out to me when when you demonstrated um, um, using your puppet was just how um, the, the shift in um, power or agency mm. towards the child as being the one who holds the knowledge and the is able to then um, there, there was this dynamic that really shifted when mm. when you um, you asked you know could we could the the child perhaps explain um, or, or share what type of animal um, there was this incredible shift to the child who then became the one who was the holder of the knowledge that's and, right and yeah so it was, yeah. it was a beautiful yeah. um, demonstration well, just this real you. power that was um, incredibly special and I can imagine um, you know an, a, a valuable tool in positioning the child um, mm. in a very different way to perhaps what they may be in other research. Particularly children who we regard as other uh, who you know 
who have a disability, who are coming from a traumatic background, who we think perhaps may not be knowledgeable. Mm. Um, my automatic default position is that they are always the more knowledgeable other and the puppet is the less knowledgeable other and I don't, I'm somewhere in the middle that kind of makes, facilitates their conversation. Um, mm. Sometimes I don't know and the puppet will look at me and say, you know, how do you not know that? And then I'll look at the children and say, I don't, could you tell me in the puppet? So it's playing with those power roles. Mm. But I think children, particularly children with disabilities, rarely have any power um, or say enough. So they try to have that agency mm. in other ways mm. or to, to wrestle it back mm. from very well-intentioned, often adults. And it's just trying to see where the opportunity is. I'm um, always, you know, I remember Robin always talks about accepting offers in Victoria, that's talk about accepting an offer. And I think with the puppet, the big thing is the name. Whatever, and I've never had a child say a word that is not a, appropriate, um, but, but I've had children maybe call a puppet three mm. and their teachers will say, oh, you can't call the puppet three. And yes, you can. That's a beautiful name. And the puppet loves being called three. Do you know? So it's giving. And suddenly by acknowledging that child's response as being valid, mm. the rest of the children in the group who had already picked up that this child was a bit quirky or had some different answers or who generally didn't, you know, kids know who's got the power in the classroom or who's different mm. and who's not included they suddenly see that child slightly differently yeah. because the puppet really liked being called three. Mm. Puppet can give cred to, you know, so. And in a way, and I often I think it's very important in your research if you're using a puppet to have the same puppet revisit. Unless there's a, a real dislike for a particular animal and a child is frightened by cats and you bring in a cat puppet, but I always ask those questions in advance, yes. you know. That's that's really important. Yeah, I loved Terry's um, comment in the chat around um, the the puppet creating this safe space, and I, I'd love you to elaborate on that a little, Terry, um, if you if you could. Uh, looks like Terry may have frozen. She's yeah, it is such a beautiful life. point, isn't it? Isn't it? And um, and I loved. Um, I loved the the vulnerability that the puppet is able to demonstrate mm. in yeah. in not knowing or being unsure or or being vulnerable. Yes, um, and and modelling um, that as 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 being something okay. accepted and and okay and even encouraged um, in that setting. Um, yes. it, I guess it speaks to what you were saying. Um, Yes, I can see Terry's having trouble yeah. with, with her. Um, the interview. puppet can evoke feelings. So rather than telling children to have nice words, the kind of language we often hear in primary school and early childhood settings, you know, to be a friend, be kind, um, outside voices, inside voices, using a particular puppet in a particular setting in a, for a particular part of the day can set the tone. Mm. A baby puppet will evoke gentleness and kindness. Yes, yes. So I have a baby dinosaur in, in Neg. Everyone's kind and calm and very, you know, ca all caretakers of, the, of this baby. I don't have to ask anyone to be gentle and have nice hands or nice words. Yes. So the puppet evokes those things. And I think then that connects. Educators then start to see children slightly differently. Mm. Oh, I didn't know he was like that. I didn't yes. know she could do that. Yes. So our we can view from that distance a little bit more mm. and get a broader picture of a child mm. and all of their selves. Mm. Mm. And Olivia, my last question is a curiosity really. Um, do you have any um, next steps or any um, you know, future research that you're thinking about um, engaging with, with your puppets? Yes, I'm very curious about taking the next step into puppets and autism um, and puppets as a tool to develop children's language. Yes. Um, there's 
just been a huge study by the Henson Foundation in the US that shows that children with autism will look at a puppet much more than they'll look at a person. Mm. So we've got the eye contact, mm. the next. But what I found in my 15 years of teaching children, you know, and in my research is that they will speak to, they will intercommunicate, yes. um, sometimes verbally. Yes. But absolutely non-verbally so to actually but to get something yes. uh, bigger than what that you know to really look at how teachers could use a puppet to communicate effectively with children make them feel safe take the anxiety away and to learn about them yes yes oh. so that's my dream <laughs> oh exciting next steps though isn't it yeah. And it looks like we have Terry back again. Uh, Terry, is there anything that you wanted to, to ask about or any comment or anything that you wanted to add before we, we wrap things up today? Yes, so much. Um, I'm sorry, that I, I'm at a school and the Wi-Fi, I think, because everyone started their classes, the Wi-Fi is just not holding up. Um, thank you so, so much to you You're and to Michael. That was outstanding. I love, I've got a lot of stuff to say, none of it's structured. So it's just all going to come out as I think of it. Um, I love how respectful you are of children. I think that's one of the things that stood out for me the most. And I think that it's something that now that I do have a child of my own, it's something I've become so aware of is how quickly people speak down to children and how quickly they assume the children are are not wise and intelligent and intuitive. And I feel like your work starts from the space of respect and that had a huge impact on me. Mm, um, I, also, I also love the idea of shifting that power balance. I think it's so important. And I think people, especially adults, especially um, teachers are petrified of shifting the power balance because what happens when? Um, and I know it's completely different ways of working, but it made me think so much of um, Mantle of the Expert and what yes. happens when, yeah, when, when you allow children to enter mm -hmm. into that place of the one who knows. And as the, as the facilitator, you sit and you're like, I don't know, what can you bring to this conversation? And it's so empowering. And I really love how you've done that with, with puppets. It's so wonderful. Um, Oh, there was another point. What was it? Oh, and you asked about the research thing. I'm still, I'm going to think it through and I'm going to give you a proper answer. But off the top of my head, my research is about how knowledge is, drama knowledge is recontextualized in the learning in the school space, which is why I spend so much time in schools. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that bringing a puppet in would add a sort of a whole additional part mm -hmm. to that conversation because their knowledge is almost moving from the curriculum through the puppeteer through the puppet to the child so it adds a, a whole layering to that process of movement of knowledge um but I'm, I don't feel like it's a satisfying answer and I'm not happy with how I've thought it through so I'm going to give it some proper thought Good. and then get back to you <laughs> and hopefully, um, Terry, when you're with us next time, um, you can continue to share because that sounds like fascinating research. It well. does, yeah. At the moment, I'm in the quagmire, like I said, so I'm not quite sure what it's about at the moment. No, we've but all been really there. Enjoyable. <laughs> and it, oh. it's actually quite nice, but suddenly you emerge and you think, oh, it's that, and it'll come to you. I don't know if you're like me. Usually the wee hours of the morning, I suddenly sit up thinking, yes. that's my research Oh, what? <laughs> yes, the, the clarity at, comes when yes. you least expect it. Yes. Um, at the moment, that point feels like it's somewhere in 2067. <laughs> so it's been lovely to meet you, Terry. Thank you so much. And thank you for your like, kind words. Um, yeah, and, and to you. That was yes. so wonderful. It's, oh, I'm so energized. Thank you. That was such what? a lovely way to start the day. <laughs> well, that's yeah. what it's for. So be in touch if you need anything. Olivia. Absolutely. And Susan, lovely to see you again as well. Yeah, Thank likewise. you. Likewise. And so our next session is going to be on Thursday, the 17th of November, with, and that will be our, fi our final session for the year. And Dr. Christine Hatton from um, the University of Newcastle, which Terry is about an hour and a half north of Sydney in New South Wales, um, is going to present on drama research methods. So you might be interested in yeah. dropping in on that one <laughs> as well. It seems right up your, right up your research alley. Um, I'm hooked now. I'm coming to <laughs> as many as I can. 
Absolutely. Well, it's been wonderful that you could join us today, Terry. And um, on behalf of us, thank you, Olivia. Really You're very appreciate welcome. you taking the time um, to share with us today. What an inspiring and, as you say, Terry, an energizing session. So big thank, thank you to, to thank you. Thank you both so much.